Hello, good morning, and welcome back uh, to our study of the book of Hebrews. And today we're going to start chapter 7. We finished chapter 6 last week and talked about the certainty of God's promise. And as we looked at the, the end of the chapter, we saw how God uh, used uh, Abraham as an example of what uh, trusting in him and his provision is like. Abraham was probably the perfect model because in his life we saw that he had his ups and downs and sometimes he failed the test, but God remained faithful in the process. And then ev eventually Abraham received the promised son, um, Isaac. But Isaac, as we saw, was a picture of uh, Abraham's actual seed, which was uh, Jesus Christ, because through Jesus we have the promises there because the scripture says that uh, the whole uh, family of the earth will be blessed through his seed and his seed was Christ as we saw and we also saw that Abraham didn't quite receive the totality of the promise in the sense that he was looking forward uh, to the city of God so one day we will all be united with our father Abraham and that's what we talked about so and we talked about the fact that the people that the writer was talking to were people that were going through persecution as a result of their faith in Christ Jesus and some of them were being tempted to go back to Judaism because they wanted to avoid the persecution and uh, we talked about between chapter 5 and 6 how the, the writer was calling them to account he said listen if you guys go back to an old system that cannot take away sins you are leaving the perfect for the imperfect and the reason why he was saying this is because some of the guys and some of the people that were doing that they were not mature um, believers they had been saved for quite some times um, but they hadn't uh, quite and grasped all the 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 basics of the faith so he called them to account and say listen you guys need to grow maturely because if you don't grow maturely chances are you're gonna fall away and we talked about uh, falling away and what it meant to fall away because not everybody is saved and sometimes as believers we might go through a period of time where we doubt and we struggle and uh, the writer was writing to, to encourage his reader saying, listen, I know what I say to you. I know what I, I said, some very harsh words. And those were, they, those were actually good because godly uh, sorrows lead to repentance. So he wasn't trying to scare them. What he was trying to do is tell them, listen, this is serious stuff and you guys need to pay attention. So now that he had their attention, he talked about the promise of God and how God is faithful. And now... He ended chapter 2, chapter 6, by talking about Jesus being uh, a priest after the order of Melchizedek, Melchizedek. And the whole reason why he was talking about Melchizedek is because he wanted to show that Jesus far exceeds the high priest. Because the high priest, um, they, we saw that there were many numbers and some of them went quite um, uh, good as far as like leading the people and being uh, mediators because some of them were, became callous. They didn't have compassion and we saw in chapter 4 that jesus uh he truly has compassion because he's not unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but he's one who was tempted in every way yet without sin and as a result we are called on to come to the throne of grace to receive to receive mercy and 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 in 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 times of uh, need so today we're going to continue and we're going to talk about melchizedek because the writer has been mentioning melchizedek time and time and again and now he's going to reveal the identity of melchizedek so who is melchizedek is what we're going to look at today and we're only going to focus on hebrews chapter 7 verses 1 uh, through 10 so what i'm going to do is i'm going to read the passage and then we're going to break it down so let's go to hebrews 7 verse uh, 1 through 10. so the scripture says for this melchizedek king of salem priest of the Most High God met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first by translation of his name King of Righteousness, and then he is also King of Salem, that is King of Peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was, to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi will receive the priestly office, 
have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers. Though these are also descended from Abraham, but this man who does not have his descent from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now, this is heavy stuff that we need to understand. So what is he trying to tell us in these uh, scriptures? It's what we need to learn. Now, if you go to verse 1, he begins with, uh, for, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. So we need to understand why this is so important. See, the writer, he ended chapter 6 by saying that Jesus was a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So he began to talk about Melchizedek in chapter 5, but then he had to stop his discourse because understanding the importance of uh, Melchizedek required a certain level of spiritual maturity. So we saw in chapter 6 that he spent some quality time exhorting his readers to renew uh, their spiritual fervor. Okay, And now that he had their attention, he resumes his argument about the nature of the priesthood of uh, Melchizedek. So he wanted to show through scriptures that Melchizedek's priestly order exceeded that of Aaron's. And Jesus' priesthood was after the order of Melchizedek. So if you could show them through scriptures that Melchizedek's order was better than Aaron's, then it will automatically show that Jesus is a far superior priest than the Levites. So verse 1 pretty much is a brief uh, introduction of the identity of Melchizedek. Now Melchizedek is not only king of Salem, but he is also priest of the Most High God. And that's important. Because we talked about the fact that no one, uh, even the king, could assume both the, the role of a priest and a king. And then those that tried to do that, to usurp the, the position of the priest, were severely chastised by God. We talked about King Saul, who offered um, unlawful sacrifices. It wasn't, it wasn't lawful for him to do it, and he did it anyway. We saw that in 1 Samuel 13, and as a result... God removed him from being king because he did not obey the law. He was a king that wanted to assume the role of a priest, and he was not allowed to do that, and God disciplined him. We also saw another king, King Uzziah. He forced himself to, into the temple to burn incense and was struck, uh, was struck with leprosy by God. That's in Second Chronicles 26, verse 16 to 21. So we learn from this that those that wanted to assume both the role of a king and a priest were severely chastised by God. We saw that in uh, those scriptures that I just mentioned. But there's something interest, interesting about Melchizedek. Melchizedek was allowed to be both king, king of Salem, and also priest of the Most High God. So the first thing that we learn about this uh, mysterious figure, Melchizedek, is that he is the only one allowed to assume both the functions of a king and a priest. And we, if you go to Genesis 14, verse 18 and 22, we will see that. Let me read Genesis 14, verse 18. Listen here. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. Let me repeat that again. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. So we see here that he is both king of Salem and also priest of the Most High God. So that gives him that dual role. He can be both king and the priest at the same time, and nobody else was allowed to do that. So point number one, Melchizedek is the only one to assume both the role of a priest and a king. Now, he was not a counterfeit priest because his ministry was legitimate. And we will see that in the verses to come. Because Aaron and the Levites were only ordained as priests. They were not kings. So they were not ordained as, king, as kings. They were only ordained as priests. Now listen to what verse 2 says here. 
and to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first by translation of his name king of righteousness and then is also king of Salem, that is king of peace. Now the first thing we talked about is the fact that Melchizedek is the only one allowed to be both king and priest. Now we're going to talk about his name. What does his name mean? Okay, now we already mentioned in verse 1 that Melchizedek, his ministry was legitimate. But we, before we talk about aspects of his ministry that makes him uh, legitimate, we need to talk about the meaning of his name. Okay, according to verse 2, Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Now that is huge. Because in the Old Testament, name when just given to people for the sake of giving them names like today. We just give people names for no reason. People call their kids all types of crazy names. But in the in the in biblical times, when somebody was given a name, that name carried with it the character and uh, basically uh, the attribute of that person. It was a title. So my name name is Taib. Taib means in Arabic. A merciful so that means this is what characterizes me okay so in the bible that, that it was like that for example when peter was called by jesus jesus changed his name from simon to peter which means rock okay and there were several other people abraham at first it was abram and then god called him abraham so people name were changed in order that their character will also reflect who they were uh, jacob went from Jacob to being called I, I am Israel because Jesus changed his name. Listen, he said when he was wrestling with the angel of the Lord, uh, I will not let you go until you bless me. And then the angel of the Lord asked him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And the angel of the Lord told uh, Jacob, your name will no longer be Jacob, but now you, you're going to be called Israel. So Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And his name pretty much runs parallel to his character. So God gave him the name Melchizedek, not by accident, but because God wanted him to be known as a king of righteousness. Then his second title is king of Salem, which also means king of peace, according to the scripture. So Melchizedek is both king of righteousness and king of peace at the same time. And we're going to see that those two pieces, like righteousness and peace, they go hand in hand. And why is that so important? Because we need to know why. Because God is a holy God. And holy means that he is, he is, there's none like God. He's in a category of himself. There's none like God. There can't be. There can only be one God. So God is holy in that way. But he's also holy because he's morally perfect. He's righteous. So be to, to, for us to be righteous is to be at peace with God. So to be righteous is to be at peace with God, with God because God is righteous. And God said, I am holy, for therefore you shall be holy. So the prerequisite to be uh, at peace with God is to be righteous. Okay? But the scripture tells us in, in the book of Romans that there is none righteous, not even one. So we need what? We need a mediator. We need a mediator. And a high priest who can represent us before God, before the throne of grace. So one who is both what? A peacemaker and who's also, who also can stand before God. So this is why Melchizedek is so important, so important because Melchizedek is what? He's priest of the Most High God because he's king of peace and righteousness. He has those two qualities. He can appear before God because he's righteous and he can also be our bridge to God, a peacemaker, because he's merciful. Now, if you go to uh, Matthew chapter 5, if you read uh, the Sermon on the Mount, listen to what Jesus says in, uh, I want to read you uh, verses Nine, and I also want to read you verse uh, six. Listen, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied, for they shall be filled. Okay, and then the next thing I want to read you is verse nine. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Okay, because... Uh, and in verse 10, I can add that too. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So why is that so important? See, Melchizedek is both king of what? Righteousness and peace. So 
he 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 is the king of righteousness he is king of righteousness and he's also a peacemaker according to what jesus says righteousness and peace those are prerequisite to be right with god to be at peace with god so the the old system could not establish that because under the old systems uh the sins were not washed away they were only covered so now you see why the writer want to continue to link uh, jesus ordination to that of melchizedek because it's so important in that way see and another aspect mentioned here about the legitimacy of melchizedek is that is that he received tithes from abraham that's so important because long before the levites were established as priests who were to receive like a tithe from the people abraham paid tithes to melchizedek we see that in in genesis abraham literally paid tithe to him so abraham the patriarch paid tithes to melchizedek like for me and you we are not Jewish people, so we don't see the weight that this carries. It may not mean much, but for a Jewish reader, this is very important because it legitimizes Melchizedek as a high priest because Abraham paid tithe to this man. And Abraham is, like we said, he is respected in the Jewish religion. He is highly venerated and honored. So if Abraham himself paid tithe to Melchizedek, he legitimizes Melchizedek as a high priest. Okay, so now, so far, let's let's talk about what we've talked about. We've learned we've learned that Melchizedek is the only one to be allowed to be both king and then priest. And second, we see that he is king of righteousness and he's king of peace. And those two elements are uh, a prerequisite for us to be right with God. Okay, and then Melchizedek is a priest that can achieve those two things that we just saw it and we saw that abraham also recognizes his ministry because abraham paid him tithes now it leads us to verse three now listen to what the scripture says here he is without father or mother or genealogy having neither beginning of days nor end of life but resembling the son of god he continues a priest forever why is that important again this is another key point of the identity of uh, Melchizedek so because we need to establish that this was a real person he wasn't he, this wasn't a case of a theophany or some kind of Christophany this was actually a real individual he existed okay but God purposely did not mention his genealogy and his family line and we need to know why Moses was uh, prompted to do that by the Holy Spirit when he was penning down Genesis there's, there's a reason why God did that because the writer in verse 3 is using the argument of silence. But this is very valid. Why? Because Melchizedek was certainly a real man. Like I said, he was a king and a priest in a real city. But as far as the, the biblical records are concerned, he was not born, nor, nor did he die. Again, let me repeat that again. As far as the records are concerned, he was not born, nor did he die. And why is the writer using this argument we need to understand it because in this way he is a picture of the lord jesus christ the son of god because the scripture says he is without father or mother or genealogy having neither beginning of days nor end of life but what resembling the son of god he continues a priest forever so the scripture mentions that but resembling the Son of God, he continues as a priest forever. Basically, Melchizedek was a prototype of Christ. Even though Jesus died touching his humanity, he did not die touching his deity. And after his death, what happened? God glorified his humanity after his resurrection. So he became a high priest because he passed through the heavens and he seated at the right hand of God. So he continues forever. And Melchizedek was supposed to give you give us today a picture of christ was going to be like so in that way melchizedek resembles the son of god because he had neither beginning of days nor end of life so when jesus says that he's the son of god he's basically saying that he's of the same essence as god so melchizedek in that way resembles the son of god because in the records we are not given his genealogy he, he has no, neither beginning of days nor end of life, which means he continues forever as a high priest. 
He is not like the Levite. He does not die. So that's the picture that the scripture is trying to show to us. And the, uh, this picture is supposed to be likened to that of Jesus. So the application is very clear. Neither Aaron nor those who followed after him could claim that they had an endless life because they died. Okay, they were they died. Aaron died, his sons died, Eli died, all the priests died. So they could not be kings and they could not be priests at the same time and they didn't have an endless ministry. So you can see how the, the writer is building his case. We went from king and, and priest to king of righteousness and king of uh, peace to now an endless ministry. So in every category, Melchizedek exceeds to the 10,000 power the Levites. Now we're going to go to verse chapter, verse 4. Now listen to what he says. Now he drops a punchline here. He goes, see how great uh, this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. Now what's the observation? See, Melchizedek was great because Abraham the patriarch, who is highly, highly regarded by the Jews, recognized his authority and ministry because he gave him a tenth of all the spoils. See, if you go back to Genesis 14, verse 17 to 20, let's read the scripture. The scripture says, After his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. And then the king, they are referring to Abraham. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said to Abraham, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Why is that important? So after Abraham defeated Chedorlaomer and his allies, the king of Sodom went out to meet Abraham, right? But prior to meeting the king of Sodom, Abraham was met by Melchizedek, who, was, who then blessed him and made an interesting uh, statement. Melchizedek made sure Abraham understood who gave him the victory over the kings. It was the Lord. And Abraham did not question Melchizedek's authority. He didn't say a word. He received it and he, he, he gave him a tenth of everything. So how do we know that? Because he gave him a tenth of everything, okay? So Abraham understood the importance of Melchizedek because as we saw in earlier chapters, one of the role of the high priest was to represent mankind before God. So Abraham, by giving, giving him a tithe, was recognizing his authority, okay? I also want to mention verses on 21 to 24, which are very important. So let's go to verses 21 through 24. Listen to what happens. Now, and the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the persons, but take the good for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, that you should say, I have made Abraham rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre take their share. So why do you think Abraham was saying that to the king of Sodom? See, by saying those words to the king of Sodom, Abraham was indirectly recognizing the authority of Melchizedek. Why? Because Melchizedek was not ashamed to boldly uh, declare to Abraham where his victory came from. He told Abraham, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God the Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. So Melchizedek told Abraham, listen, you won this victory because God gave you this victory. So he was basically Abraham's intercessor, okay, because he is the you know, priest of God Most High, both king and priest at the same time. And he appears uh, to Abraham to tell him, listen, I interceded for you. So God gave you the victory. Now you need to recognize this. And Abraham gives him what? A tenth of the spoils. Because Abraham is recognizing his authority and he legitimizes Melchizedek at that moment. So Abraham was so, um, tithe was so significant because it symbolized the recognition of Melchizedek's authority. 
So you can see how the writer is just argument after argument. He's presenting his case and then he again drops another punchline. If you go to verses five through 10, let's listen. Listen to what he says next. And those descendants of Levi will receive the priestly office, have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is from their brothers. Though these are also descendants from Abraham, but this man, Melchizedek, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself receives tithes, paid tithes to, through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Why is he saying this, this, this word here? See, in verse 4, we just saw that Abraham himself recognized the authority of Melchizedek by, re by receiving a blessing from Melchizedek and then giving him his tithe. Now, in verses 5 through 10, now the writer is presenting a very strong argument to show how greater Mel Melchizedek's priestly order is than the Levite. See, the Levites were appointed by God as priests, and they were to receive tithes from their own, the other tribes of Israel. So, now when Abraham acknowledged the greatness of Melchizedek, the 12 tribes of Israel were involved in the process, okay? The tribe of Levi included, because Jewish people believed in ra racial solidarity. And this is an example of it, because when Abraham paid his tithes to Melchizedek, the unborn generation was also involved in the process. This is why he uses the argument in verses 5 through 10. He said, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Basically, the Levites were also involved in the process. They also paid tithe to Melchizedek. Basically, they are less than Melchizedek. If Abraham was the father of all the tribes, paid tithe to Melchizedek, Levi uh, indirectly is also paying tithe to Melchizedek. This is what he's trying to show here, that Melchizedek is a far superior um, a priest than the Levites because they actually paid tithes to him through Abraham, their father. So you see how he's just presenting one argument after the next. See, when you and I hear these words today, it doesn't really give us goosebumps like it did those people who were reading the letter. See, they understood the writer's argument. Clearly, it wasn't ambiguous to them. For us, we're like, okay, what does that mean? I don't care. No, like, it, it really means a lot. Okay, because his main objective is to show through scripture that since Jesus' order was after Melchizedek, as declared by God himself in Psalm 110 verse 4, and because Melchizedek's order is greater than Aaron, then Jesus is greater and is the best and is the highest of the highest high priest because he passed through the heavens. He has an endless ministry. He is both king and and he's also priest, and he's both king of peace, and he's also both king of righteousness, and he is greater than all. Now, to me, this is also strong proof that of the divine origin of the scripture, because God knew, God knew that a newer generation of believers would indeed someday need to be reassured about Jesus. So he, he allows Melchizedek to appear all the way in Genesis, so that today, uh, the writer of the book of Hebrew could use that argument to show how Jesus' order is after Melchizedek. Now, the Bible is a collection of books. I had an interesting conversation with one of my friends the other day who said to me that the Bible was written by people who wanted to dominate other people. I'm like, where did you hear that? He can give me an argument for it. First of all, the Bible is a collection of books written over thousands of years, like 2,000 years pretty much, if I'm not mistaken. And each book has by different authors. And each author has a portion of the story. And the way, the, the harmony with which scripture comes together is incredible. I mean, I have so much more arguments about the veracity and the validity of the scripture. For, to, but to me though, one of the most interesting aspects of it is the harmony with which scriptures come together. They converge to the same point. 
and that is Jesus Christ. The story begins with Abraham, and then you go all the way through the book of what? Genesis, Exodus, every single one of the stories points to Jesus, all the way to Revelation, which is the, the finality of all of it. I mean, it's incredible. So the divine origin of the scripture is so clear. But again, the scripture says that to the natural man, these are foolishness. But to me and to those that believe, this is great news. Now, to wrap this up, we talked about the identity of Melchizedek. Who was Melchizedek? We know that this was a real man that existed in history. And he was allowed to be both king or king of Salem and king of what? King of also he was also a priest of the Most High God. They only want to be called king and priest at the same time. And the second, we see that he is king of righteousness and he's also king of peace. And then third, we see that Abraham himself recognizes Melchizedek's authority by paying tithes to Melchizedek. And we see that Melchizedek doesn't have a genealogy. He doesn't have a beginning of life and an end of day, so he continues forever as a priest. So all those elements... Again, the writer is building his case, which we're going to see verse, from verses 11 to 25. He is trying to show how Jesus derives his ministry after the order of Melchizedek. And there's a reason for it. And then next week, we're going to find out what that reason is. But today, all we wanted to see was the, the origin of Melchizedek and who is Melchizedek and the identity of Melchizedek. And then next week, we're going to talk about why this is so important for us today. Again, and one of the things that I've really enjoyed about the book of Hebrews is understanding how Jesus really came to identify with humans in order to be a high priest of better things, of a better hope, because he truly understands the human experience. Again, I've, I've, I'm, I'm asking the Lord to give me uh, reassurance about me coming to the throne of grace because the, one to, the, the person uh, whom I come to understands my condition. He knows what it means to be a human. And because he's sinless and he's separated from sinners, doesn't mean that he's isolated. He can truly have compassion and help me because he said, because I've overcome the world, you shall also overcome. So whatever you're going through, I say, let's go to him because the scripture also tells us in First Peter, cast all your burdens upon him for he cares for you. So it's a real thing. I don't just want to have these things like theoretically. I want them to be applicable in my life. I want to live it out. And that's what I've been asking the Lord. And I pray that this is also what you're doing. Okay? So have a wonderful day. And i see you next uh, week. Thank you.